Wow, that was amazing. Let's, let's give the boss another hand. <laughs> that was really great. I, I think I'm just biding time till he comes back up, right? <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know, our very own Josh does an amazing uh, job with his tribute band to the boss. And if you have an opportunity, he works with some amazing talent. And uh, I think I went to see him on 4th of July a, couple, a year or so ago. It was really great. Uh, good morning. I'm happy to be with you here this morning. God, it's raining in Southern California. Now, wait a minute, there's false advertising, right? Because <laughs> it never rains in Southern California, another popular rock song. Um, before I, I go too far, I just want to thank our new music minister, Karen Allen, for bringing new voices to the stage and for really pulling everything together. Thank you, Karen. She's doing a lovely job already. And it's only January, just wait. Did you know that today is Ernest Holmes' birthday? Oh. Yeah, it is the Ernest Holmes' birthday. There's a virtual birthday party that the Science of Mind Archives is doing online. It happens at 5 o'clock today. There will be some quotes and some speakers. And if you're interested, I know that the link is on the main website, www.csl.org. Org, or it's also in the um, monthly Science of Mind magazine. You can find it there as well. And so there'll be a wonderful tribute, speaking of tributes, be a wonderful tribute to Ernest Holmes today uh, through the archives, and you might want to check it out. So this year we have a new theme. Each year we, as, we, as the calendar rolls over, we bring forth a new theme. We, we work with the um, Centers for Spiritual Living that helps to put together these wonderful themes that thread through the calendar months as we go forth and walk out each year. Um, last year was Living Out Loud, and this year is a grand rising. And this idea of a grand rising is really the opportunity for us to, now that we have practiced living out loud to really start our day in a grand way, to start each day with our spiritual practice, waking up, knowing the highest and the best for ourselves and for the world. And so we're going to dive deep with that. And in January, it's my preference to look at the first four chapters in the Science of Mind textbook. I have my, my dog-eared 25-year-old science of mind textbook that I've been working with. It needs to be rebound. I've got pieces to come out. But, it, but in it is um, all the energy that I have put into my you know, reading and studying the science of mind textbook. For those of you who might be new to our philosophy, this is the, uh, the basic ideas that we teach in this philosophy called Centers for Spiritual Living. And and we, we really do teach a science. And so we've been looking at these basic ideas that we teach in Science of Mind. Um, in the, on the first Sunday, Reverend Judy talked about the thing itself. On the last week, on the second Sunday, I talked about the way it works. And today I'm talking about what it does and how, when we begin to understand how it does, it does offer us some newness. It offers us an opportunity to experience life anew. And so I, the thing that I want you to know is that rolled up in these first four chapters is simply the creative process. So Judy talked about the thing itself. Last week I talked about the way it works. And today I'm talking about what it does. This thing that we refer to as the creative process is sort of the secret to how the universe works. Yeah, we talk about that. We teach that right here at Centers for Spiritual Living. All centers all around the country and the continent, around the world, when we are teaching Centers for Spiritual Living, we are 
and the philosophy that we have and, and everything that's in this book called the Science of Mind textbook is, revolves around this thing called the creative process. That when we experience life, it is the result of our use, I'm going to say that very carefully, our use of the creative process. Now, oftentimes, for, for much of humanity, we use that creative process unconsciously. We're unaware that there's a thing that moves through the world, the, the universe, that the energy that creates form all around us is constantly in effect. It is constantly moving from th uh, thought or from the seed idea into form. And when we come to a philosophy like this, we're not the only wisdom teaching that looks at the creative process. And when we come to a process like this, um, or a philosophy like this, where we're beginning to understand the creative process, we can consciously engage in it. And therefore, we can create newness. And so this, this symbol that you have up here, you, uh, hopefully you can see it, there's a very, very, um, light outline of a, of a V. And uh, this is a teaching symbol that represents our relationship to consciousness and how we use it. Now, next week is how to use it, but this week I'm really talking about what it does, the, the form and how do we, we come to this thing called life. How do we come to this, these experiences that we have? We're always working with the law. We're always working with thoughts, and those thoughts move through the law or the soil to create form or our experience. And what's, um, I'll leave that up there for a little while while I talk about this. What's tricky is that we are co-creators with this this thing called life. We're co-creators with the thing that makes the grass grow. And so, Spirit just wants to create out of itself through, by means of each one of us. It really just wants to have expression. And, you know, the, the, when we have been brought up in various cultures, oftentimes we have been taught that there's this anthropomorphic being, and really what that is is man's imposing its own form on spirit. But the truth is that spirit simply imposes expression on us. And then we have an experience in the world based on our beliefs, based on the, the deeply held thoughts and patterns that we have in our consciousness, and that spirit just wants to express itself. And so, of course, we project the human experience back up to a creator, but the truth is the creator is giving us full license to create whatever it is that we believe and embody. Now, I think sometimes it gets a little tricky. I was, as I love rereading these chapters. I've been rereading them for a long time, and yet every time I read them, there's something else that kind of bubbles up for me. And so I was reading this one line that Holmes says, or writes, actually. He says that we can only know God insofar as we can become God. This is to be taken figuratively and not too literally. We cannot really become God, but we can and do partake of the divine nature, and the universe does personify itself through each one. So that was sort of a broadening of an idea that I've been walking around with, knowing that we are expressions of God, that God, you know, I kind of think of it as the the um, ocean and the wave, right? You can't ever separate the ocean from the wave. The, each, each, diff, each wave is an individuated expression of the ocean, and each human being, each plant life, each animal is an expression of the divine. And so I think it's important. I, I really appreciate this teasing out that Holmes does to help us remember that there is a power greater than us that we can call upon. And that it, while we are all, while everything we are is God, we are not the allness of God. And so for me, 
when I'm looking at wanting to create a new life, when I'm looking at trying to create some change in my life, I, it's, not ju it's just not me and my own steam over in the corner trying to figure this out. <laughs> I, have, I have this same thing that has designed the universe in the structure it is, the stars and the planets that all orbit each other in, in perfect um, uh, patterns that support the universe, the, the thing that makes the grass grow, the, the environment that we live in, all of it is by divine design. So when I am drawing upon this power, when I am choosing to know myself as God in form, I am the expression of that power. <sighs> wow. <laughs> when I can remember that, then maybe the the situations or the circumstances that I'm working with, suddenly I have some real power to work with. It's not just me trying to figure it out. However, <laughs> then here's where the rub is. It's hard to remember that. It's hard to, re and, and what does that look like? And, and how do I connect with that power that makes the grass grow to help me solve this thing of maybe, you know, I'm trying to figure out a more economical way to live, or maybe I'm trying to, you know, create relationship in my life or find a new job. Like, how do I tap into that? Well, we're going to talk about that a little more next week, but the point that I want to make is that there is something that you can tap into. There is a power greater than yourself that wants to express by means of you, wants to, to be you at your highest and your best. And when we can remember that, when we can bring our attention to that fact, when we can raise our consciousness to that place where we understand that there is a power for the universe that wants to move through us and express us, well, we are empowered once again. Sometimes the, uh, the challenges of daily living can weigh kind of heavy. I know this because <laughs> I'm a human being too. I have the same experience as you do. I, 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 I will use the word struggle. I know there are some, you know, absolutists who would say we're not supposed to admit our, our humanness. We're supposed to just look at the absolute truth of all of life. But I see it a little differently. I think that when we recognize that we're working with a creative process, that there is tremendous healing and freedom when I can recognize the places where I trip up where I can see those places where maybe I have done a lot of work to um, nurture and cultivate something that I really don't want. <laughs> through, <my laughs> right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> what the thing sucks to be me. <laughs> no, it doesn't because I have tools. I have this teaching. I have a philosophy, the things that we learn in classes, the the things that we learn in our friendship circles that support us in, in recognizing those thought patterns that we're carrying around that aren't helping us, that aren't serving us, that continually create undesired effects in our lives. I was thinking about how in the beginning of the new year, oftentimes that's the time when we want to we want to create something new, right? We want to maybe shift a pattern. We want to, maybe you want to do more journaling or, or maybe you want to, you know, become f healthier. You want to exercise more. Well, the, the, the real secret sauce to working with the creative process is that what we truly embody, what we love, is what we express. It's what, it's what moves through our lives with ease and grace. And so if maybe you want to exercise more, you need to ask yourself, do I really love exercising? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> do you know, but, but what, one of the things that I really love is I love my body temple, and I love feeling healthy, and I love this person, Alice Reed. And so what Holmes says in this chapter on what it does is that it is... Um, and I want to get this right, love points the way and the law makes it possible. 
So we need to be clear about what it is that we love. And, and we use that word love pretty casually in our culture, but I'm talking about the things that you really care about. I'm talking about the things that, that happen through your life when you don't really have to think about it because it's something that is part and parcel to who you are. What is it that we love? And we may need to cultivate um, a deeper passion for what it is we want to change. We may need to look at the ideas and the beliefs and the patterns that are underneath some of the things that we want to create in our life and maybe unbundle or clear away the, the thought patterns that aren't supportive of that. As I was um, thinking about this week's um, no, first, I want to read this Holmes quote, which really supports this. He says, undoubtedly, we are surrounded by and immersed in a perfect life, a complete, normal, happy, sane, harmonious, peaceful existence. But only as, we, as, but only as much of this life as we embody will, we really become, will really become ours to use Sounds a little idealistic, doesn't it? To, that we live in a, a, a perfect life that is complete and normal and happy and sane and harmonious. I mean, you know, life, we all bump into stuff in our life. We, we have things that don't feel sane, that, you know, don't feel, make us happy, that don't feel harmonious. And, and those are the places where we are to do our work. Those are the places where we begin to explore what we believe and what we think and what we hold in, in, our, in our minds. Um, Kathy Ann Lewis likes to say that everything we experience, uh, we experience and have some responsibility in through four different methods. We either create it, we allow it, we promote it, or we step in it. And sometimes we step in it. And sometimes when we step in it, we're also allowing it, right? Sometimes we're promoting it because we're not cultivating what it is that we really want. I read this great quote the other day that said, change doesn't happen as long as you tolerate something. As long as you are in this place of tolerating something that you don't want in your life or in your world, well, Change isn't going to happen. This, we're, we're not sending a very clear signal to spirit, are we, if we're tolerating the things that we don't want to experience in our life. And so this process of the creative process um, really requires us to be clear, to be clear about what it is that we want and we don't want. And that's on the personal level, and that's on the community level, and that's on the worldwide level. And when we think about it that way, it can seem a little overwhelming, doesn't it? Like, how can I change what's happening in the Ukraine or in the, on the Gaza Strip? It's, it's a little improbable to think that one person can change the world. But what I know is that we can look at our own places where we hold discord. We can look at our own places where we are othering. We're looking, look at our own places within ourselves where we might feel the need to um, overpower or protect ours. This philosophy helps us to understand that the creative process needs a clear pathway through you. And we can create those clear pathways in our own backyard. And what I know is that there's a, there's a rippling that happens because when we begin to embody peace at a deep level, when we begin to unbundle the places in our consciousness that don't support peace, when we begin to cultivate a true expression of peace in all our relationships. I, I stood in uh, Luna Grill last night picking up my dinner. They were 
packed. And I watched as this man hung over the register and was like, where's mine? Where's mine? Where's mine? I mean, I, I couldn't hear the conversation, but I could feel the energy of his impatience, you know. And I watched these two young, young kids. I mean, they were working. They were, there's an old farming. They were gene and haw, and that means everything was working in place. They were getting the food out. And so when it was my turn, you know, and there was a part of me that was feeling a little impatient. Like, gosh, I knew it was, if I knew it was going to take this long, I would have maybe done something else. Or, you know, I felt that come up in me. But instead, I chose to be that peaceful presence. Instead, I chose to think peaceful thoughts. Instead, I chose to really celebrate them for all the hard work that they were doing. And it's, and, and if you look at, like, the, the, the wars that are happening in the Ukraine or in Gaza, that can feel like nothing. But it's a start. And when we cultivate peace and then we begin to express that peace in all of our behavior and our interactions, then, I mean, people in that store had a choice. They could be the guy at the counter drumming his fingers and being impatient, or they could be the guy that was sitting there, you know, just really celebrating um, how hard these people were working. And so we model that. We are the change we want to see in the world. We get to create that with every action, with every interaction. And it is the kindness and the love and the things that we're passionate about that are going to change the world. It's a, it's a little slow for me, I'll admit. <laughs> it's a little slow. And, and what I have recognized with this creative process is that there are some things that I can work with my, my seed ideas and I can plant them in the soil and boy, they come to fruition right away. It's easy peasy. I had a, um, years ago I was in the transition of moving from a nine to five job to a business and I remember writing down on a piece of paper the things that I wanted to experience in a job. I wanted to have employers that were respectful of my talent I wanted to have a lot of flexibility. I wanted to be able to, you know, be paid well for my expertise. I had a couple of other things, and I remember writing it down on a piece of paper, and I stuck it on my bulletin board, and I went about my business. And about a year later, I sort of took stock of where I was. I had started working part-time for uh, a couple of guys who had a lot of respect for my expertise. They gave me a lot of flexibility so I could start my own business while I was working for them. They paid me well. I mean, everything I had, had um, in, wanted to embody came forward for me, with, and it was, it was easy. I didn't have to do a thousand affirmations and you know, work with a prayer partner. It came through very simply. There are other times. <laughs> when we want to create something in our life, that it takes a little more. Um, it take, it, we, it, we need to be patient. We need to be patient with ourselves. The, the other big thing that I've wanted to create in my life is more intimacy in my significant relationship. And I can tell you that over the 25 years, I have, I have had a gradual increase in a more meaningful, and um, intimate relationship with significant others. And there's been a lot of change that had to happen. And it didn't happen in the people that I was involved with. It happened in me. I was the one who had to be more open and more intimate. You know, when I started out, it was him. <laughs> he was the one who, you know, was all shut down. The way um, the way it works and what it does, those two work hand in hand. Once we understand how it works, and then we begin to allow it to move through our lives through conscious choices and conscious decisions, we can create a new life for ourselves. It's amazing, and I, and I can imagine there's, 
at least a dozen people in this room who can tell you how they have practiced this philosophy, how they have put one foot in front of the other, and how they have created great change in their life. And as a matter of fact, as I was you know, putting together my notes, it was great. And reading these four chapters again, it was great to, to kind of go back to when I first worked, walked into a Center for Spiritual Living and to look at all the progress, look at all the shifts, the maturation that has happened because I have been practicing this philosophy. Let's see. There's any other quotes? I don't think so. What I, what I want to invite us to think about this week is when we understand what it does and what the spirit does is it moves through our consciousness, it moves through our embodied beliefs, it moves through those subtle beliefs that we don't even know we carry, and it creates our life and our experience. And so my invitation to you this week is to look at those places where you might have deeply held patterns where it might be time to take that next step in consciousness and shift a behavior or change something in your life that isn't serving that higher idea that you want to experience. This philosophy changes lives, and I think it changes the world. And so it's up to us to continue to mature with this philosophy, to continue to work these principles, to take classes like the visioning class that closes after next uh, Wednesday morning if you're interested in taking a class or maybe dropping into the um, adult Sunday school we're doing this afternoon or signing up for a, um, a friendship circle. Those are all ways where you can have good company to support you in creating this new life. Because what I'll tell you about the universe is there's big fancy words for this process I'm going to describe, but it's a cycle. And the law just keeps repeating itself. You know, lather, rinse, repeat, lather, rinse, repeat. If we have an idea about the world and how it's going to show up for us, it's going to continue to show up that way. The big word for that is deductive reasoning. But when we introduce a new idea to that cycle, the law just says yes, and we can change that cycle to a different experience. That's called inductive reasoning. <laughs> Fancy words for changing your mind and beginning to cultivate the ideas, the principles, the values that you want to embody so that you can indeed create the life you want to live and help us collectively to create a world that works for all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and pray. Whew. And so the invitation this week is indeed to do that inner work, looking within. It may be that what we see around us gives us the clues to what we want to look at. And so we invite the power and the presence, the divine love that wants to experience itself as us. We simply invite it in. We allow ourselves to be that place where spirit expresses itself in its highest and, in of course, our unique way. And so in this moment, as I speak this word, I know this truth, this highest truth for each one, that we all are perfect, that there is indeed a, a deep harmony that lives within us, and that that harmony is revealed in greater and greater ways as we walk out this week, as we choose to be that place where love shows up, where we choose to be that place where peace shows up where we choose to be that place where beauty shows up. It is indeed God expressing itself as each one of us. What we know is that we are the mold and God is the substance. So we surrender ourselves to this substance. We allow ourselves to be expressed 
as only spirit can express itself in each one. And we celebrate. We celebrate our willingness to be that place where God shows up as us. I know this to be power. I know this to be beauty. And I am grateful for it. So I thank the universe for this beautiful creative process. I thank myself for being willing to be conscious with it, to consciously evolve. I thank all those around me for being willing to see me as my maturing and evolving self, as I work with the law, as I impress it with my love. I know this is true. I know this for me. I know this for you. We simply let it go and let it be. And together we say, and so it is.